probably know most of you, but for those of you who are new this uh, semester, my name is Dr. Neary, and I organize the Lunchtime Talks in Science and Math. We try to have about six or seven of these presentations each semester, so you can find uh, the schedule of talks for this semester either posted online, uh, on, the, on the Campus Google Calendar as well as the Math Program uh, homepage, and then also outside of all the classrooms in this building, we usually have these schedules as well. So in a couple weeks, uh, and I've already forgotten who's coming up next. So, uh, I would announce it. What's that, Dr. Chooker? Oh, that's right, Dr. Chooker on the Thursday before homecoming, right? And he is from the University of Pennsylvania, I believe. A uh, physician there is going to be talking about the uh, field of medicine and a variety of things there. So I'd encourage you to come back to that uh, here in two weeks. We always have pizza available for everyone, and it looks like periodically we may also have sodas that you can purchase. So bring your 50 cents or a dollar, whatever the price is going to be. So with that, um, the first in our series of presentations this semester is going to be uh, given by four individuals. They are each quarter scholars, so they are all uh, science and math majors. They are also quarter scholars, which means they receive some support, some financial support from a foundation uh, endowment that was set up by uh, by Bill Porter, one of our alumnus from um, last century, and very generous individual. So. Anyhow, one of the benefits of being a Porter Scholar is that you can apply for support for what we call focused academic programs. So these are typically uh, some sort of individualized plan that is going to help you further your educational and career goals. And so students will submit a plan for a focused academic program, and depending upon the earnings of the endowment, they may, uh, may or may not receive funding for that. This past summer, uh, four of our Porter Scholars went with Dr. Armstrong uh, and part of a larger group to Australia, and as you can see from the photograph right there, it was summer <laughs> for us. Uh. But you do know that they switch when you go down south that way. So, without further sure. ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our four speakers. So it's Jason Roth, uh, Drake Cisneros, Darren Cisneros, and Tavia Carlson. And you'll I'll be taking about what, 10 minutes apiece, something like that. Mm -hmm. Somewhat. Learning that on some of the research that they did uh, for part of this program. So please help me welcome our speakers. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nearing. So just briefly, I just want to mention how lucky, lucky I am to have the scholarship. It's been giving me so much opportunity over the years. I was able to go to Costa Rica last year, and the year before that, we kind of had a tour around Colorado and was able to look at some um, kind of geological sites. And so I thought this is just a great opportunity to be a part of this trip as well. But um, this is, my talk's going to be a little bit about, kind of like just the promotion of it, because I mean, I really appreciated this trip overall and I thought it was super fun and just a unique experience and um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Sydney and some of the stuff we did around Sydney and then also uh, a little bit about um, the Aboriginal people that are within Australia. So Sydney, this was like one of the coolest things for me um, because we flew from California all the way to S Sydney and we crossed the international time zone and we, because of this, we had lost one of our day of our lives. So we, we left on a Monday, lost our Tuesday, and ended up in Australia on a Wednesday. So we were a little upset about that. But then after we realized uh, we got it back on the way over back to the States, we weren't too upset. But um, day one, we came, kind of checked in uh, to the airport, kind of exchanged some bills. We were kind of interested to see like the brightly colored bills with some of their unique animals and um, some of them like the, like the uh, marsupials on the backs of them and stuff are pretty interesting. Uh, day one, we were able to walk up to our hostel and saw this great view of Sydney Harbor Bridge right here and then the Sydney Opera House. And this is something you always saw like, just growing up like in your textbooks. You're like, oh my gosh, this thing's so cool. You know, this is like the iconic building that you think of. Um, so we kind, of, we kind of ventured around. We were kind of exploring the, the city. We were pretty excited. And upon uh, arriving to the Sydney Opera House, we noticed that the opera house was kind of tiled, and we're like, I thought it was kind of like this, you know, flat, brilliant white color. And as like when you kind of approach it, it's more of like a grayish kind of color. But um, uh, Sydney in general, they had a great subway system, and we were able to kind of hop on for and take like a 15-minute ride out to the outskirts of the city, and we would end up like in a national park. Um, the first one we had went to was Royal National Park. This one we kind of had to take a little short little ferry and ended up 
in this uh, area here, just have like a short, small little picture on that. It was just this really great beach coastal area here and um, a great way to kind of hike and kind of observe what their national parks were, were similar to and also just a great walk on the beach. Um, and also close to the, um, the Sydney Opera House was this botanical gardens. They had tons of different trees there. I would say probably uh, 15 plus species of trees and this was probably just an indicator of just how, how much biodiversity is in Australia in general. Uh, here's this tree, it was pretty wicked. It had this um, really cool like root system. If I had a side view of this tree, it would be kind of growing on its side and uh, it just like it looks really cool how it kind of worked. Um, within, I think, day two, we had made our way to Red Hands Cave. Um, here's a, kind of a, just a picture uh, along the hike that we had taken on along the cave. And here's one of our uh, geography majors that's kind of really amazed about some of this like sandstone stuff here. This picture is kind of taken at like a pretty good time too because I had smacked my head in this little corner here so I'm kind of <laughs> rubbing my head there. And then also um, being in Sydney we were able to catch a show at the Sydney Opera House. Uh, we had went to a dance theater. Um, this was a show called Patagorang and this was just kind of a show that kind of talked a little bit about um, just how the Aboriginals came to be and just kind of the story about when the, like, the British kind of um, colonized the area. So this was kind of my first encounter with like, the Aboriginal culture, I guess. Um, just a brief overview of the Aboriginal people. Um, they, were the first, they first migrated out of Africa to Asia about 70,000 years ago. And, and then they then ventured to Australia about uh, 50 to 60,000 years ago. And one hypothesis was that they kind of hopped along a series of islands between them just by boat. Um, and one source had indicated that maybe they were here a lot longer, about 125, uh, 100,000 years ago. And um, I don't think that's really that plausible, but they had one source that indicated that. And this is actually a picture of Red Hands Cave. They had, um, just, I don't know, they didn't really explain the significance of what the cave was about too well. But they had um, just kind of, they pasted their hand in a die, placed it against the cave here, and then they also had the negative image here where they would put the die in their mouth and like kind of blow against their hand, you know, making like a spray type gun. Um, so I'm going to talk about the colonization of the Brits. Um, so prior to colonization, uh, the original numbers uh, were about 300,000 to 1 million. And then after post-colonization, um, when the first fleet came over in 1788, uh, this brought along diseases. Um, I think one to note was just smallpox was just a huge contributor to um, a decline in the population. And the population actually decreased to about seven, 75,000 people. And this was in 1933. Um, you can see that some of the, influence, the influences throughout the country, on um, the Australian flag, you have the Union Jack here. On the $5 bill, you got Queen Elizabeth. And even on our walk with one of the Aboriginal tour guides, uh, we were just having uh, like soda biscuits and uh, tea. So, I mean, you see that influence there as well. Um, so what does their population look like now? So there's about 700,000 Aboriginal people currently, and they did make up about 3% of the population. And some of the regions that have like the most people would be in the New South Wales region, and the Northern Territory has the greatest percentage. Um, and majority of these people live within about 50 kilometers of the coast. Um, and their population pyramid just looks super ugly. So like if you notice here, the indigenous people are in blue. Um, you notice that a, lar a large portion of their population is from like 15 years or younger. And at the higher end of the population pyramid, there's um, like a low percentage of um, older people, so greater than 65. Um, so like this, right this, you can probably make some like, conjectures to think about, OK, what, what's the issue here? And this is just probably due to just maybe some health disparities that may be causing the older people to maybe die off earlier and their lifespan to be a lot shorter. So I'm going to uh, briefly touch on some of the disparities. Um, so many of the Aboriginal people, they live close to 200 to 1,200 kilometers away from big cities. So as you can imagine, they live in these remote areas where maybe service isn't as uh, adequate as um, those for the, ra the rest of the population. Um, so they earn, like, on average, about 55% uh, less than the average Australian family. And so they also have like higher rates of imprisonment and unemployment, and just also they're considered the most disadvantaged group. Um, they have an increase in infant mortality, drugs, alcoholism, and just general poor living conditions. Um, 
like I said, their average lifespan is kind of a lot worse than the rest of the population. It's about 17 years lower. And this is kind of like weird to think about, you know, with Australia having such a great economy and um, one of like the leaders and like they don't really take care of their minority population. Um, so the, some of this could be linked to disease. Um, the aboriginals are kind of face diabetes and this is about like a two times um, the rate of the rest of the population and they're more um, prone to getting heart disease as well. Um, this is about, they affect them about three times more than the rest. And then they also have these diseases that are associated with poor living conditions. This is just uh, your pneumonia and scabies. And then an interesting one that I had meant, uh, found in my research was uh, a disease known as trachoma. And this is caused by like a chlamydia type of organism. And there's the World Health Organization had developed this program to completely eradicate this bacterium um, by, the, by the year 2020. And they have this list of like 54 countries. And of those 54 countries, Australia is the only one that's uh, a developed country. So it's kind of uh, weird to think that, OK, they're doing so well. Like, why can't they help these um, Aboriginal people out? And some of the causes for like the discrepancies within the diseases and the increased rates, I mean, I think they just kind of in inappropriateness is with uh, health care and then just in general um, lack of service in the remote areas. And also maybe I, you could probably even think about their education system and that, you know, they, there's a strong correlation between literacy and health care. Um, those that tend to be less literate are, tend to not take care of themselves as well. So here's, um, I just kind of briefly wanted to highlight some of the, the names that we had saw on one of our hikes. This was uh, kind of cool to see that some of the culture is incorporated with Australian lifestyle. So we had these really long names that I'm not going to begin to pronounce. but. Um, our film professor, Danny, that came, came along with us had kind of commented that they sounded like baby talk, so like Mugu Long Cascade, so that, that was kind of just funny. Uh, here's a really beautiful uh, waterfall that uh, my brother and I had to stop to eat lunch at and um, kind of just a longest hike. Um, we, I just want to briefly mention what we uh, went on. This We went on this Dreamtime walk hike and uh, one of our leaders, he was an Aboriginal tour guide, and he just briefly wanted to talk about his beliefs and culture. His primor, primary reason for leading this was just to um, kind of preserve his culture and kind of communicate some of his beliefs and explain how he lived off the, the land when he was younger and things like that. Um, so our tour guide was pretty animated. We had some really great shots of him. Um, another guy that was working with him as well. So it was kind of interesting to be able to get some culture uh, on our trip. And I'm going to turn it over to Jason now. Um, he's going to talk to you a little bit about the geology of Australia. Thanks, Rick. Yep. All right. I'm Jason Roth. I'm a geology major here at Iowa State. And I did my research looking into how geology plays a role in ecology. And if, um, about three and a half, oh, sorry about that. OK, so roughly three and a half billion years ago, um, the continent of Australia was formed uh, in the Archean Age. And that landmass was reamalgamated into the, la the supercontinent of Pangaea, which was all of the super or all of the continents as one large landmass. Um, around 180 million years ago, Pangaea separated into Laurasia, and so Laurasia's right here, and then Gondwana down here. And Gondwana was actually South America, Africa, Australia, Antarctica, and India or at least the continental plates of those places. And that continued for a while. While this was Gondwana, that was actually a uh, very dark and cold rainforest that existed at that time. And as rifting occurred, Gondwana actually began to split up into an eastern and a western half. The eastern half was uh, South America and Africa. While the western half was going to, it was actually and, uh, Australia and Antarctica. And then around the late Eocene, around 36 million years ago, those split up. And that allowed for a short or a small ocean to form in between Antarctica and Australia. It wasn't until later that that allowed ocean currents to actually develop. The ocean currents allowed cold water to localized down here around the poles, which allowed glaciation to happen. 
when glaciation happened, the world climate became quite a bit more arid. And so the rainforest that covered much of Australia at the time started to recede and they were actually pushed back. A lot of my research actually had to uh, do with how much of the vegetation is endemic to Gondwana as opposed to being rafted over uh, via oceans and arriving at a later time. This diagram here shows that roughly half of it, 45%, is actually Gondwana in origin. And one of the biggest, uh, or one of the most exciting or interesting uh, was the Nothophagus, and it's also known as the Southern Beach. Those originated in Antarctica originally, when Antarctica was a cold, dark forest. And they were able to, uh, when Antarctica and Australia split up, they were able to migrate with it. And so we find the fossil of the southern beach nowadays that resemble the, the modern day southern beach that we see. So it was pretty interesting. We saw a lot of uh, the Nothophagus trees when we went to Lamington National Park, which I'll tell you a little bit more in a second. Right now, I just wanted to kind of give you guys a general impression of how, um, so originally, this whole area was rainforest at one time in the, in the distance past. But because there's a stretch of mountains right along the coast here, and because the winds from the ocean come from the west, or I'm sorry, from the east headed west, what that allows is that it uh, allows all of the precipitation to develop right here along the eastern coast. And because Australia moved up into higher, or, I'm sorry, lower latitudes, closer towards the equator, that allowed for a wide variety of different uh, temperature zones to develop as well. And that created quite a bit of microclimates, which is important because the microclimates allowed for these uh, indigenous Gondwanan species to be able to survive into modern day times. And without the microclimates, you wouldn't, allow, you wouldn't see any of these old species that were able to survive. Now, while we were there, we were actually able to uh, work our way up from the southern coast up to the very top of the northern east coast. And so we transversed through uh, several different types of rainforest. Now, uh, at the very top, we have the Daintree National Park, which we went to. And that, that's a good example of that would be a tropical rainforest. And um, some of the, some of the uh, big features of the tropical rainforest are that you have an uneven canopy. And so it has a very different uh, types of trees that stagger how the canopy looks. You have a wide variety of vines and epiphytes that are in the canopy. And epiphytes actually, use, they, they don't have roots. They, they actually use the mist and the humidity in the air and actually use that as opposed to having a root system. Uh, you, you see here what are called buttress trunks and that is a result of the poor soil. Because Gondwana is so old, it had a lot of time to weather and weather out all of the uh, nutrients out of the soils. And so it has poor soils and the way that these plants respond to that is by having these big buttress trunks that provide stabilization. Um, also, another really interesting thing is the cauliflower uh, pattern of growth, which means that you have the fruit that grows directly on the trunk of the tree as opposed to on limbs or on branches. So that's, that's pretty, uh, those are some of the big features that you find in the tropical rainforest in Australia. You also have subtropical rainforest, and a good example would be when I was telling you about Lamington Park. And uh, you have a mixture of tree species at this point, so you also have kind of an uneven uh, canopy. You have various leaf shapes, that, so you have big broad leaves and you have small tooth margins. And then a lot of the common plants that you see are going to be palms and strangler figs. You also can see the buttress tree trunks, but they're not quite as common. And then you, the epiphytes and vines that you see are going to be large as well. We also have a temperate rainforest, and a good example of that was when we went, uh, went and visited the Blue Mountains National Park. Now, these have only a single species of tree in the canopy, so their canopies are very uniform. And if you look at this picture, you can barely tell, but this whole hillside, it, it's all one tree species. Now, um, the leaves there are actually all small, and they have tooth margins, which means that they have little uh, ridges on the edges and that's to deal with the cooler climate. We also have uh, small ferns and epiphytes that, are, that you see here as well. 
Now, uh, one of the things is that you do not see the palms, the strangler figs, or any of the buttress tree trunks that you see in the other two types of forest. And then the sclerophyll forest is actually a type of forest that is replacing the rainforest of Australia. And that is actually due to the onset of arid conditions. Um, there's also, the, these trees were originally uh, part of the rainforest, the ancient rainforest, but they have adapted. And their adaptation has uh, responded to, because it's more arid, they were able to dry out and have forest fires. And these have responded to um, take advantage of that, allow it to burn off the other growth, and then come in and outcompete the other species that were there prior. So this sclerophyll type of forest is actually what comprises a lot of Australia at this point, and has taken over the original rainforest. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand this over to Darren. Okay. So uh, I did my research on marsupials. And I mean, thinking about Australia, that's one of the major things you think about, just marsupials in general. Um, it's just a very unique species that um, we're not quite used to. It's a very different lifestyle compared to um, pl the placentals that we, we see. So to start off, I'm just going to talk about some general characteristics. Um, for one, they're an infrared class of mammals. So there's actually three classes of mammals. There's placentals, which we're used to. As human beings, that's what we are. Um, there's monotremes, which are kind of egg-laying um, mammals, which are somewhere in between like a reptile and a mammal, and then there's uh, marsupials. So some things that kind of characterize marsupials are the fact that they have very short gestation times. And as a part of that, a lot of their development has to occur like ex uterally outside of the uterus. And um, they, a lot of the development occurs in a marsupium or the pouch, which many of you guys I'm sure uh, know. So they also have hair and they nurse young. Um, and in Australia, and New Zealand and New Guinea, that's, they contain about 70% of the world's um, marsupial species, whereas um, the remaining 100 species lives in S South America. Right here um, was kind of like a taste of all these kind of exotic species that Jason and Danny were able to try. This right here is actually kind of kangaroo steak. So some people actually try kangaroo. It has like a really, very gamey type taste. Um, just marsupials in general just are a huge part of the culture there. I mean, it brings lots of money in for ecotourism. Many people want to come visit. So right here, um, they have a lot of the marsupial species on their coins. Um, right here, we actually had to go to a conservation center to see a koala, because they're pretty hard to see. Um, for the most part, they're hiding in the trees. They're very, um, they sleep for throughout like 18 hours of their day. Um, right here, the picture doesn't look too good in the dark, but um, that's actually a patty melon. That's a different marsupial species kind of more uh, rodent-like. Um, evolutionary history of marsupials. So kind of back to Jason's talk, we kind of, he talked about uh, Pangaea, the major supercontinent that broke apart into uh, Gondwana and Laurasia. And Laurasia, from Laurasia, um, many of these marsupial species, they head westward to kind of modern day South America and North America. And um, they kind of inhabited there for, for quite a long time. There was a, when North America and South America connected through the Isthmus of Panama, there was this great American interchange where species kind of uh, interacted and um, kind of just di diversified. Um, right here, I, I mentioned these three species again. Uh, marsupials are actually part of a larger class of metatherians, whereas placentals are part of eutherians. Um, so, and it was actually kind of quite interesting to me that marsupials were able to dominate, and um, they were actually the more, more common, most common species in North America until about the Mesozoic era, and they persisted there until to the mid to late tertiary. So they, they were there for quite a while. Um, South America, they uh, survived longer, and of course, there's still more there today. There's about 100 species. They actually began to go extinct in the late Mies Miocene and early Pliocene. And it was from South America that they actually were able to get to um, Antar uh, Australia because they crossed through um, Antarctica when it was attached. About 50 million years ago is when Antarctica broke away from um, Australia. So right here was actually one of the monotremes. 
uh, there's actually two monotremes. There's the platypus and the echidna. And we are actually very lucky to see this echidna, just because it's pretty elusive. And it, it, you have to see them at night because they're nocturnal. And kind of a fun fact is, if you guys remember Knuckles, he's actually an echidna. So I had to put that there. Um, right here is when we were in Cairns. We were looking up into a, a tree. And we, we were able to see these, uh, these flying fox, they call them. Uh, they're this species of megachiropta, like these mega bats. They're these fruit-eating bats, and then every night um, these bats will take flight. There's hundreds of bats that take flight in the air, and they, um, they're just a beautiful, remarkable sight. Um, marsupials, they've, like I said, they've, very, they've diversified quite, quite well. Um, they've, they can range from small four-footed species to large kangaroos that are over six foot tall. Um, there's been many examples of convergent evolution where these marsupial species kind of um, fill the same niches that many of our placentals do. Um, we have, they have burrowing forms, grazing forms, and gliding forms. And one thing I found interesting during my research is because um, during development when the, when the embryo um, has to climb up from the, to the mother's pouch, the forelimbs are already differentiated. That way they can climb up the fur and get into the pouch. And they have these differentiated fa facial st structures to where they can attach to a nipple and kind of permanently attach. So because their arms have to be differentiated to climb up to the mother's pouch, um, they have only like grasping type hands. They don't really evolve anything separate from, from that. They don't have like claws or um, like, I don't know, like web type structures. Um, they live in diverse habitats. I mean, Australia is pretty vast in, in the sense that like it has desert, rainforest. So they fill a variety of habitats. Um, nocturnal, they're active throughout the night. Some of them are diurnal throughout the day. And crispuscular is kind of throughout the dawn and dusk period. Um, right here is a bandicoot, just a small, small rodent species. Right here is actually a wallaby. Um, it's kind of a miniature version of a kangaroo. We were quite disappointed to not actually see a real kangaroo. But this guy kind of served the function because it's just they're cute and adorable miniature versions. <laughs> um, right here, I thought this was kind of humorous just because that's kind of a problem they have to deal with. It's actually kind of some of their roadkill. Um, adaptations. So because they um, have this ex utero development, they've had to adapt to kind of supplement this lifestyle. Um, for example, um, um, because placentals have this trophoblast layer um, around the placenta, this actually protect, protects the embryo um, from the immune system of the mother. And because marsupials don't have this um, trophoblast layer, they have to kind of make sure they um, have short gestation periods to get that embryo out. That way it can survive. Um, and also, because a lot of it, um, they need to get nutrients while it's outside the womb, they have this complex lactation system, which actually kind of occurs in three phases. Uh, one of the first phase, kind of the, the embryo is permanently att attached to the teat. Second phase, it's kind of more intermittent, and like the, the milk composition will change throughout. For example, like there's gonna, first it starts out as being high in um, carbohydrates, and within the third phase, it switches to more lipid and protein-based, and a larger production of milk to just kind of supplement uh, a lot of the needed nutrients. Um, one thing I found interesting in my research is um, that these marsup oh, oops. Let's see. These marsupials, actually, they kind of don't have to bury the burden of many of the stresses that you get from regular um, internal birth because they can actually get rid of their young, the young during development, meaning like if any time they get stressed out due to climatic conditions or predators nearby, they can actually eject their young, and that way they can kind of live another day to reproduce another day. So it's kind of, they can offer it as like a peace offering, I guess, and get away. <laughs> Right here is our little wombat friend. Um, Armstrong came across him during his two weeks prior to us going. And he kind of followed us throughout our entire trip. He uh, stayed in our room, stayed up, kept up on Facebook, and kind of messaged mom and dad. Um, he, he was always making sure, keeping tabs on when we came in and making sure we were there on time. Um, so right here, um, because even though Australia is like a major source of marsupials and like it draws many people, they don't have the best track record of maintaining their species. Um, the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, lists about 200 species that are of some kind of concern, like being threatened. Um, and these are kind of just as a result of habitat destruction, overexploitation, 
competition with exotic species and livestock. Uh, many of the Europeans, they kind of brought over species that kind of um, took over the land. Like they brought rabbits over just for hunting purposes and they kind of took over the land and really set up a problem for these um, indigenous species. Um, so research to kind of combat this kind of focuses on habitat fragmentation, predation from introduced species, emerging disease, climate change, and human encroachment on habitats. Um, so, I mean, this is actually pretty sad that, that they don't have this track record of maintaining their species because they're actually pretty helpful and uh, essential to their environment. For one, they regulate the insect and plant populations. Um, they help in pollen and seed dispersal for their many um, unique species. They aerate their soil and human benefits. I mean, they use them as food. They're a huge e economic factor as many people come across from all over the world to see these things. Um, they help for just agricultural pests and things like that. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tavia, and she's going to talk a little bit about biodiversity. All right, so I did my research on biodiversity. Uh, this is just a picture of us on the sailboat uh, going out towards the Great Barrier Reef in Cairns. So just had to include this picture of us. But so Australia is one of the most biodiverse nations in the world. I mean, it's probably the reason so many people want to go there. I mean, I know it's the reason I wanted to go there. I've wanted to go there since I was a little, little kid, just because you hear about all these cool things that are there. So I mean, there are, I saw varying numbers on the for species in Australia. Uh, most consistent was 600,000 different species that live there. So. Just a general term for biodiversity for those of you who don't know. So it's generally describing the evolutionary legacy of life on Earth. So it's all the variability that we have among living organisms. And that's on three different levels. That's the genetic variability in our organisms. It's the variability of species. And it's also the variability within ecosystems. So biodiversity can be a very complex thing, but it's mostly just look at all these cool different things. So. Australia was able to have this high amount of biodiversity because they've been geographically isolated for such a long period of time. As you know, previous people have mentioned, uh, it got separated from uh, Antarctica and Gondwana. So from that, we were able to have a lot of radiation of these very unique species. So the World Conservation Monitoring Center identifies mega diverse nations and these nations basically contain the majority of biodiversity on the planet. So in these 17 mega diverse nations we have 70 percent of all the biodiversity on earth in just 17 different nations. So these are listed down here. Uh, this is just the number of endemic vertebrate species in these countries and as you see Australia has the highest number of endemic vertebrate species. But if you look at these nations, uh, many of them aren't developed nations. The only other really highly developed nation on this list is the United States. So with that comes sort of a responsibility as the Australian government sees it to protect this biodiversity because not only is it present in that country, but they also have the resources and you know the capability to protect it. Whereas a lot of these other developing nations uh, biodiversity is really threatened just because, you know, their species, their habitats are being threatened just because they need it to develop, you know, you need a clear cut because that's how they're getting their money. So there's a bit of a responsibility for the Australian government. But, and this is number of endemic uh, plant species, which is fifth there. And as Jason talked about, I mean, we were able to travel through a multitude of different uh, ecosystems and plant communities just in our short little trip. So along with that biodiversity, much of it is endemic to Australia, so you won't find these species anywhere else. They're only in Australia. So 84% of the plants, 83% of mammals, and 45% of birds are all endemic to Australia, so nowhere else. But along with this endem endemism comes a lot of threats to that biodiversity. So as Jason showed in his presentation, much of the precipitation in Australia all falls along that eastern coast. So along with that, that's where most of our biodiversity is. And also, as you go towards the equator, you have an increase in biodiversity. But if it's nicer there, 
people want to live there too. So obviously, habitats get encroached upon by human beings. So since European settlement, which is about 200 years ago, over 60 species of plants and 50 species of animals have gone extinct in Australia, and that's not even taking into account the number of threatened species, which I could go on and on and on about. But I just figured I would talk about a couple of the places where we saw some of the most biodiversity. So as we took our trip, we started in Sydney, and we worked our way up the coast, going closer and closer towards the equator until finally we ended in Cairns. Uh, two of the places we went in Cairns were the Daintree River. So these are just a couple of shots of the Daintree River. And really what people go to the Daintree River for is crocodiles. So wherever you go in Australia, you see these, you know, ads, We've got this guy holding a big hunk of meat over a boat and a giant crocodile just, you know, coming up and eating it. And that is terrifying, first off, because one thing I learned about crocodiles, I have to share this, so they're not really smart, but they'll follow patterns. So I was reading a news story while I was over there about how they finally caught a crocodile that was waiting outside of school every time the school bell rang. So I guess when you live in Australia, you have to worry about crocodiles getting your children outside the school. So things like that. So, but we were on a nice little boat. It was only us. The guy didn't hang chunks of meat over the side for crocodiles to come up. So we just got to see them from a distance, a nice safe distance. But we also got to see these little baby guys. I mean, you can hardly see them in the picture right here. And I have no idea how our tour guides are even able to spot these things. They just blend in so well. So got these little baby ones you see. I think this was like the dominant female in the area that we saw. You know, got another big one. So I think there are only like three or four big ones on that river that we were able to see, but I mean, they're still super cool. But the other great thing about when we were on that tour guide is our guide also uh, was a bird watcher also. So we learned a fun word for bird watchers. It's twitcher because they're always twitching to look at birds. So we also got to see a lot of bird species while we're on the river. And really, the whole trip, we were seeing multitudes of bird species. But it was winter, so obviously didn't get to see as much as we wanted. So this is a heron. I'm not really sure what birds these are. I took pictures of them, and I don't remember. <laughs> Dr. Armstrong might remember more than me. But I think these are herons that were on there. So they're always cleaning their feathers. They're just really majestic looking birds that we got to see. And then also what was really cool is if you see this, this little, little yellow thing is a little yellow bird that was actually building this nest right here. So it just looks like a piece of debris that's falling off the edge of that embankment. But it's actually these nests that they build. So that was actually really cool for us to have that pointed out, that there's just this little tiny yellow bird building these really cool nests. So that was one of the places we got to see some of the most biodiversity. I mean, we saw countless numbers of birds and fish and just different things on this trip. I mean, I could not recall all of the different things we saw. But and then we went to the Great Barrier Reef. And that's where we ended our trip. And I didn't take any of these pictures because I obviously don't have a camera nice enough to get cool pictures like this underwater. So I just kind of looked up some of the pictures of like the main ones I remember. But I mean, this is the Great Barrier Reef. I mean, we've all seen pictures of that. I mean, our whole life, I mean, hundreds of species. And the Great Barrier Reef is actually super important to Australia's economy. Uh, I saw a lot of different figures, but most of them range around at least $200 million alone goes into Australia's economy just from the Great Barrier Reef. So one of the many biodiversity hotspots there. So on our tour, we had this nice small little sailboat. You know, there were, I think there were 50 of us on board, which is nice because when you go out on the reef, you see some of these boats that have, you know, 200 people on them. They're all going to get into the water at the same time. So you're just in a school of snorkelers, which isn't really what you want to see. But a lot of the tour boats actually have these really friendly wally fishes, is what they call them. I couldn't figure out why they call them wallies. I have no idea, but they're just these giant goofy fish and they hang around tour boats. Like these tour boats, a lot of them just have this one really friendly giant fish that just likes to hang around. And sure enough, we pull into deep water at one of the spots and there's just this wally fish hanging out. But one of the coolest things I thought about being at the reef is, I mean, if any of you have ever gone snorkeling or scuba diving before, most of the time, all of the, the fish and the turtles and everything like they're really afraid of you and they just you know dart away as soon as you're there but the reef they do not care that you are there at all I mean I saw a sea turtle and I was able to get like right close next to it and it just 
looked at me and swam away. I mean, they just are completely unfazed by you. So, I mean, you're really able to get up and close to that wildlife. So, saw these wally fish, uh, sea turtles, which I mean, they're always cool. I mean, it's a sea turtle. We've all watched Finding Nemo. We all want to see the sea turtles. <laughs> I mean, we saw clownfish, uh, which actually most people call them Nemos, which made me feel better because that's what I want to call them. So, I mean, we saw clownfish, you know, sea slugs. Uh, some of us were lucky enough to see a reef shark. I didn't. I probably would have swam the other way crying because sharks are scary. But some people were able to see these black tip reef sharks. And these are actually some of the most threatened species that currently live on the reefs. Uh, their numbers have dramatically decreased due to poaching and such things. But probably my favorite thing that I saw while on the reef were these giant clams. I mean, these things are probably, you know, two meters across, just incomprehensibly big, super vibrant, bright colors. They all have this one giant vesicle or hole or mandible. I don't remember what it's called. But they all have this one huge hole, and they're just there. I mean, you know, it's just something that you would never see on our side of the world. You wouldn't get to see something like this. And I mean, Really, the Great Barrier Reef has been something I've wanted to see my entire life. I mean, we all hear about how it's threatened. And I mean, one of the saddest things I realized upon seeing it is that you really can see the effects of coral bleaching and that there is really a lot of degradation that's happening. So it really is a big goal of Australia and really of the world in general to keep these places alive so we can have this biodiversity. Because I mean, who doesn't want to go see giant clams like this? <laughs> so with that, we have a lovely sleeping twin. And any questions, please ask us questions. <laughs>